Hi, I'm Joni Patree, and welcome to my YouTube channel. Well, today I want to talk about something that always comes up, and that is, why did you get into Vedic Astrology? I tell everyone, you know, I've been a Western astrologer, which uses the tropical system of astrology for 20 years. And then I started with Vedic astrology and I've been practicing Vedic astrology for over 20 years. And I want to tell you why and how I switched over. So before I get into that, got to give a few plugs. Remember, I just put out a new app and I'm so excited about this app. Why? Because I wrote the entire content. So when you get this app, it does your chart and every interpretation is from me. And two more things. I have a conference coming up. Please don't forget, it's in Dallas, October 25th through the 27th, futureofastrology.com. And if you want some written transcripts, transcripts of all of my predictions, sign up for my free newsletter on my website, galacticcenter.org. Now, let me get on with this pressing question that I get asked all, all the time. And I love to be the one who is the bridge between Western and Vedic astrology. I teach at most of the Western Vedic conf I mean, not the Vedic conference. I, of course, I teach at the Vedic conferences, but I also teach at the Western conferences. But I find the attendance is very low. There's not as much interest these days to learn Vedic astrology when people are in Western astrology. Why is that? You know, I can say this for myself. When I was a Western astrologer, I would look at Vedic and I would think, this is so daunting. How can you learn all of that? The 27 nakshatras, the whole new system. But if you are a true astrologer, you should study every system and see which one works and pick and choose from different systems what does work. And I have done that. I taught Western astrology at my center for years. I taught about all the asteroids and even the deeper aspect of, of from heliocentric to geocentric, from, <clears throat> from even looking at an ephemeris with where the black holes are and the pulsars and the quasars. I even did Uranian astrology within Uranian astrology. It is a German system that uses midpoints and the trans-Neptunian planets. I did that. That was a very, very predictive system. But I find nothing holds a candle to the sidereal Vedic system. And if you want to argue with, with me on that, fine. But don't argue if you've never done this done Vedic astrology. And not just put your foot in and think you've learned it, but really worked with it. Because I find so many people try to discount it that have never done it. How is that? That's just not, I mean, that's hearsay. And to me, it represents somebody who doesn't want to learn something new. And to learn something new means we're always broadening our perspective and growing. So I know there's going to be a lot of people who go, oh, well, I use this, that, and the other, and it's, you know, the best. And yes, there's people that even take Vedic astrology and use the tropical system with it. I find that very confusing. And that's okay if they believe and want to tout that, oh, in the scriptures it says this, that, and the other. I like to go by practice. It is a practical thing when I apply it and it works. Experience speaks louder than any scriptures or book passages or in the past, the historical, does it work? And are you applying astrology to your life the way you should? Not just that you're the most knowledgeable and you can quote the most scriptures. Let's see when you do a reading how accurate you are. That's where the telling is. So let me move on with what got me started in this. Well, when I heard that Western astrology wasn't the true placements 
astronomically. When we talk about astronomy, I'm like, what? Well, what are the true placements according to the astronomers? And the true placements are the sidereal system because <clears throat> it's really looking at the groupings of stars. And I always say Vedic astrology is true to the stars because as the stars move, these are the placements that we're looking at. So when we go with our phone, I hope you have one of those sky views are so cool and go out at night and look at where the planets are relative to the constellations and stars. And what you're going to find is this is the sidereal Vedic positions. These are the placements. So that was the one thing that had me start looking at Vedic astrology closer. Then I find out they don't use the outer planets. And I've made some of my most telling predictions using the outer planets. So I pulled away from it a, a bit longer because I thought that can't work. Then I just then I found out that there were many Vedic astrologers that used the outer planets. Now the system is perfect in terms of the rulerships do not incorporate the outer planets. That is the system and it works perfectly and I believe it's because the planets that are visible to the naked eye all the way out to Saturn, these are more in the physical realm of our world. But the outer planets are transpersonal and they absolutely have effects on generations and predictions of what's going on in the world. And they absolutely work. So I use the system with the house rulers, only the old rulerships. And when I say the old rulerships, that means Jupiter rules Pisces, Mars rules Scorpio, and Saturn rules Aquarius. You don't use the outer planets in terms of rulers. So most of the signs, except for Cancer and Leo, are ruled by two planets, two planets. So Jupiter rules, I mean, the planets rule two signs. So Jupiter rules Pisces and Jupiter also rules Sagittarius. So this system is so orderly and perfect. Now, when I look at a chart, I also, let me just say, I look at the whole signs to a house. I don't have, like in Western astrology, I used to use the Placidus system when I did trop tropical Western. And the further north you get, the houses get very distorted, whereas you sometimes have three signs in one house. That doesn't work. So, it is the whole sign per house. But going back to my whole rhyme and reason of getting into this, first of all, these are really where the planets are. Who can deny that according to the stars? And with Western astrology, because the stars are moving, they're called fixed. But in a lifetime, they don't move from our vantage point, because the movement is so slow, this is called precession of the equinoxes, so our vantage point to the heavens, to the stars. It, the stars, the da let's just call it a backdrop. It's like the backdrop of the stars, they're constant. Every time you go out and you look at the night sky <clears throat> in your backyard, you're going to see that the stars are always there throughout your lifetime, but that's why they're called fixed, the fixed stars. So what's moving are the planets, but in reality, the fixed stars are moving and they move one degree backwards in the 360 degree measurement of the zodiac, one degree backwards every 72 years. So it takes approximately 26,000 years for it to go through all 12 signs. And this is what makes the Vedic system where the starting reference point of the zodiac is almost a sign backwards from the tropical Western charts. But the tropical Western charts are really kind of based on the seasons and the sun. But the, but the sidereal chart is relative to the stars. And when we talk about the stars, we are talking about the, 
the stars in terms of the nakshatras. And the nakshatras, that's another daunting thing. But this is real astrology. This is what I see. Because when we look at the fixed stars relative to their positions, such as in the constellation of Taurus, we have one of the royal fixed stars called Aldebaran. And it is the eye of the bull. It's called the red one. How can you say the eye of the bull is in Gemini? And that's what Western astrologers say, that the stars, they don't, the way their zodiac is and with the way the stars do move, they've gotten off, but they're not off. So what I'm trying to say is that these will be part of the constellations. And what gives these 27 nakshatras their meanings are the stars that are within these portions of the zodiac. So we've got the, the zodiac, which is 360 degrees, and we divide it up into the 12 signs, which each sign is 30 degrees, but the nakshatras are divided up into smaller portions, which are 13 degrees, 20 minutes. And another really cool thing is that the nakshatras are called the lunar mansions. Do you know why? Because the moon moves in a day, its rate of speed is approximately 13 degrees, 20 minutes. So therefore, the moon spends one day in each nakshatra. And there's 27 of them, and it's relative to the lunar calendar, which is 27, 28 days. It's definitely more precise than the Julian Gregorian calendar, who, you know, Julius Caesar and Augustus decided that they wanted months in the summer with, thir with 31 days instead of 30. So it's just off kilter. It's not, it's not divinely balanced as with the, the sidereal lunar system. And let me go into some other reasons why I decided to go with Vedic astrology. When I heard that Edgar Cayce, who was one of the most prolific psychics uh, in his time, <clears throat> he died somewhere in, 19, in the 1950s or or 1945, I, I can't be exact, but one way or another, he, he has not been here for in a long, long time, but the research on him and the things that he did were unbelievable. What, he was called the sleeping prophet. He would go into these trances, and in these trances, he would start talking in a completely different voice, and speaking of knowledge, he had no information of at all, because he was a farm boy. He would start talking in medical terms, but this information, people would start documenting what he would say. He was one of the most prolific psychics ever. And one thing that he said in one of his transmedium sessions that woke me up was that Western tropical astrology was off by almost a full sign. It was inaccurate. That was a real telling point where I thought, okay, that's it. I've got to learn Vedic astrology. Then when I read the autobiography of a yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda, I found out that his teacher, his guru was a Vedic astrologer. And I was like, what is a Vedic astrologer? And when I found out there was these two different systems, this also put a bug in my head that this was a system that I needed to learn, the system that the great seers and saints used. So that was another clue, and my interest in Eastern philosophy grew from that. Another thing is, when you look at the stars and the constellations, you know, I go out in my backyard and I see the band of the constellations that go across the sky. I know that from, from the horizon starts Virgo and it goes all the way across to the sign of Aquarius pretty much that I can see. So I know when the moon is in certain portions, it's relative to those constellations and the stars there. I'll never forget when Mars and Saturn conjoined in Scorpio and they were exactly, according to my phone, which, which has the, the 
you know, the, sid the sidereal positions, the astronomical positions, were conjunct the fixed star in Scorpio, which is Antares. And Antares is the star of war. And this was the way that the ancients really depicted and gave their predictions by looking at the heavens and knowing where the planets were relative to these stars. And these stars, these groupings of stars are in constellations that flavor the meaning of the planets when they go through these, these groupings, which are what? The 27 nakshatras. Each one of the 27 nakshatras meaning comes from the stars in that grouping. So here's the thing. So many Western astrologers, and I mean, these are people that claim to be astrologers, talk about them being a Virgo. I'm a Virgo. What does that mean? Is your sun in Virgo? Is your moon in Virgo? Is it your rising in Virgo? And of course, they're talking about the sun being in Virgo. When people say that that's their sign, this all started really probably with Linda Goodman's sun signs. Yes, it was a great book, but this is not real astrology to talk about yourself as a sign according to where your sun is. Now, how really, let's be realistic, really, Everyone born in that month's time is going to have the same experience and be the same person? Impossible. And then again, I'll get these people that go, I can't be anything but a Scorpio. Everything fits me. How can I really be a Libra? Because remember, your, your signs, your planets, everything, it all falls backwards almost a full sign. Not quite, because right now it falls back where exactly about almost 24 degrees in the zodiac. So there's still six degrees left of the sign. So if you have a planet that is in the very tail end of a sign in your Western tropical chart, it probably stays in the same sign in your sidereal chart because it's at the very end, so therefore it'd be at the very beginning of the sign, same sign in your Vedic chart. But you just take the whole zodiac and you shift it back 24 degrees. That's your sidereal placements. And they're the true placements. But when, when people say, oh, I can't be that sign. Well, you know, most of the time we're looking at a map. We're looking at where all your planets are, not just the sun. That's ridiculous. That's like isolating your arm from your whole body and saying that's who you are. But so if the sun, let's say, let's say your sun's in Scorpio and you feel like everything about that quality of Scorpio fits you. Well, let me just say this. Probably your Mercury or your Venus will be in the sign of Scorpio because they never get that far from the sun. So Mercury is how you think. So if you have Mercury in Scorpio, you think like a Scorpio. If you have Venus in Scorpio, that's your passion for love, Scorpio. So that the, the sign will be the script of who you think you are. And another, and another way that this works, and it absolutely works, is some people say, I don't have any planets in my Vedic chart in Scorpio, but I know I'm a Scorpio because my sun's in Scorpio and tropical Western astrology, it fits. Well, let me just say, do you have a lot of planets in your eighth house? The eighth house has every meaning relative to the sign of Scorpio. So when you really learn how to work with the system and understand this, you'll see why some of these personality traits or the essence of your life relates to that sign. It's not because your sun sign is this sign. And so many people, the way I see the signs changed with Vedic astrology, it's like Virgos, people that have a sun in Virgo, they can't fathom moving back, having a sun in Leo. But what people don't understand is it's really about the nakshatras. You might have your sun in Purva Falguni, you might have it in Maga, or you might have it in Uttara Falguni if there's different portions of Leo that your sun could fall back in. And so if it's in Purva Falguni, that's the most expressive, one of the most creative signs of the Zodiac. And sometimes they're performers, entertainers. That could be relative to what we understand being about Leo. But 
the nakshatras, where your planets fall in the nakshatras, really give you the deepest understanding of astrology that you can touch on. And remember, they're always true to the stars. So we can't have, we can't say that the heart of the scorpion is in, is in Sagittarius, but the Western astrologers will say that. Or can you say that Regulus, the heart of the lion, which is everything to do with leadership, the top CEOs, whoever runs things, they're leaders. You cannot say it's in Virgo. They say now that, Ma, that this nakshatra maga, where the Regulus, the heart of the lion is, they say it's in Virgo. So I want you to know that that this, these are the true placements. And once I started using the Vedic system, the predictive value went off the charts as compared. And one more thing, the reason why people with, with tropical Western astrology get good results with their charts, and they do, did it for 20 years, is because the aspects are the same. You're gonna have planets conjunct that are conjunct in both charts. The trine aspect is the same, the square, all the aspects will be the planetary's positions from each other will be the same. You don't lose any of the aspects. And when the ancients looked up at the sky, they weren't looking so much at anything but the aspects. Were the planets conjunct? Were they, were they opposed to each other? What star were they conjunct? This is what the ancient astrologers did, and they were exquisite astrologers. Now today, we have everyone that's read a few books in astrology thinking they're astrologers. And they come on board arguing about things that they don't know and they haven't researched, nor have they studied for 40 years. So the last thing that I wanna point out is with these aspects, when you're looking at Mars squaring a planet in your, in your transiting, let's say Mars is squaring your Saturn, your natal Saturn. It's in both the tropical and the sidereal system that these aspects, these transits are occurring. They're just in different signs. Because remember, the whole zodiac falls backwards. Your, your natal planets plus the transiting planets, they're all back 24 degrees in the zodiac backwards. So these are the few things that really got me going in Vedic. And once I really started us using the Dasha system and realizing the power of looking at a chart through the moon, see, this is a lunar based system. The entire system that depicts the cycles of your life are based on where your natal moon is. What nakshatra it's in reveals what dasha you begin your whole life cycles and when everything is due to occur throughout your life. So it's based solely on the natal moon that these dashas, the Vimshotri dasha system is based. Now in Western astrology, they use um, progressions, they use the, the solar arcs, things that really point more to the sun. But I don't know how many arguments all the Western astrologers come upon and want to prove, and they want to make Vedic into Western. Don't do that. You don't know how many classes I have to teach and I have to go through everyone talking about their Western positions. And when they talk to them, they go, well, in Western astrology, and I wanna say, I don't care where it is in Western astrology. I'm teaching you Vedic. Please let go of all of your concepts. You can't put your Western astrology into Vedic. They're two different systems. So when you surrender, I had to do this because I did the same thing. Well, in Western astrology, it's this. How can it be that in Vedic? I would argue and argue with myself, with others. Then finally, I, I dropped it. I said, I'm going to learn this. And I'm not going to argue the case as to in, yeah, but in Western, it's this way. Let that go. And when you do, this is a system that will change the way you view 
the world and your life. So if you're ready to open to this, really open and learn something new and broaden your horizons and not halfway learn it, but really learn it, you'll see the experience that I went through. It's life changing. So with that, I'd like to close. I know there's going to be a lot of people that argue with this, but you know, experience, let it go. You could learn something new. So if you want to take your learning of astrology to the deepest level, I have a university where I teach Vedic astrology online, but we're a community. We have live webinars all the time, videos. I mean, this is a way to learn. And it's my University of Vedic Astrology. So check it out, University of Vedic Astrology. Dot com and go to my website if you want to learn more about predictions or consultations or readings. And my website is galacticcenter.org. Thank you.